Okay, let's get ready to rumble. Time is up. The count has gone down. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, one and all, to this Avado webinar, which is part of the Marketing Academy series from Avado. Um, I'm just going to kick off with a bit of a memory. Uh, it's casting my mind back to December 1996 when I was in my first job. I just started as a TV buyer, buying television ratings, housewife ratings for Unilever in one of London's top five media agencies. Um, and I remember turning to my boss very early on and going, I'm not sure if I'm cut out for this career in advertising. The reason was um, we'd buy the ratings and we'd end up every day in the pub at lunchtime. It wasn't so much that I couldn't do TV buying. It was actually I couldn't do the drinking. Um, so my boss gave me three pieces of valuable advice. First one, he said, don't ever get on the phone and do any trading after a boozy lunch. Just do desk work. Secondly, he reassured me it was December. It was the run up to Christmas. This is when the media owners took the media planners out for lunch and for drinks. It would stop being quite so boozy in January. But he also assured me that actually, potentially my interest may be more in the strategy and planning side more than the buying side. So I took my, my boss's advice and I moved into away from trading and into uh, the world that interested me more, the, the world of human behavior, strategy and planning. And I had a stint in the insight team at my agency. And what we used in the insight team was this, uh, the funnel. You may have seen this before, Ada. Um, and that was like we used to pour housewife ratings or housewife with kids ratings in the top. Uh, money would trickle down the funnel. And at the end of it, there would be purchase. People would buy things. That was it. If you made people aware, they would buy it. Um, this was as sophisticated as it got. But what made me interested about this was actually that um, this funnel was very old. The Ada um, model came along in 1898 from St. Elmo Lewis. So it's over 120 years old. And it was William Townsend about 100 years ago, or 95 years ago, that turned this into a funnel. We weren't being very sophisticated at the time. And as we were Unilever's planning and buying agency, we kind of went, well, that adage of Lord, Lever Lord Leverhulme that 50% of our advertising budget is wasted. We just don't know 50%, which, which half it is. We didn't, didn't really mind. Um, there was a slight move towards net promoter score. And if you measure net promoter score, kind of likability, favorability, that would also be a good proxy to sales. But that was generally as complicated as my job got. We'd then put more money towards Channel 4, ITV, and that newcomer, B Sky B, the satellite television thing. And then we go to the pub again. And that was kind of how it was until digital came along. Um, but digital changed things. And I ignored digital to start with. I was too busy learning the advertising theory and human behavioral theory behind advertising. But in 2006, I joined a mobile startup. Um, and actually, I realized a couple of very interesting things. One, what we were trying to do wasn't that different. Fundamentally, we were still trying to get consumers to buy things. We were trying to influence their decisions. Um, what we had was a slightly different set of tools. What I also realized was I was very good at um, explaining to the old people what the new stuff was doing. I had took on this kind of translator role. Um, and also when, when that was mobile and then about six years later, I moved into Google and I started working with Google and I realized how the landscape of media and how these tools had changed. But still fundamentally, we're trying to do the same thing. What I found slightly puzzling was that mobile, my baby, wasn't having that uptick, which was really odd because six years previously, every creative director, every marketing director had an iPhone. We knew that consumer behavior was a shifting to mobile, but no one was doing it. Um, yes, Anna, we are recording this, so yes, um, but only I'm speaking at the moment, so I hope that's all right with everyone. Um, and Cassie will be monitoring the chat as well. So anyway, um, what I wondered was why was this uptake of mobile, this transformation lagging behind consumer behavior? Why were companies so slow? Why did they let themselves be disrupted by these new players um, like Uber and that kind of thing? So what was digital transformation and what was the barriers to it? How could I help customers with digital transformation? And so I moved from planning and buying and selling into kind of education. Um, 
at helping people with their digital transformation. So that, that's what I am now. My name's Daniel Solomons. Um, I work still very closely with Google and with Avado, who I met when I was working at Google. And I'm now an educator and trainer. And my pet topic is this idea of human-centric digital transformation. And today I want to talk to you quite a bit about the key human that is at the centre of all digital transformation for all companies, and that's the customer. Uh, Customer-centric planning, customer-centric communications. Uh, they are the ones that really matter. Um, we are going to, I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes. I'm going to show you some brand new research that I'm really excited about that my old chums at Google have come up with. Um, and we will have a 15 minute Q&A at the end. But if you have any questions, just as Anna has done just now, just put the questions in the chat. Um, Cassie, our Avada host for today, will be monitoring the chat. Um, and if there are any juicy questions, she'll hopefully write them down and bring them up again at the end. Um, and we'll get you interacting a little bit through Mentimeter as well. So that's how we're going to do it. I'm going to talk for a little bit. Um, and before I get into the new research, I want to talk a bit about an old bit of research that I saw probably about seven years ago from Forrester. Um, and this was about technology being a disruptor. What we see is that technology has always disrupted. From the first time those saboteurs threw their wooden shoes into the machines in the 1800s because they thought they were going to take their jobs, technology has always disrupted and humans have always been a little bit behind it. Um, so what Forrester was showing here is that there's different technology in different stages and different um, phases. And the thing that interested me here is actually the Internet digital started coming along in what they've called the age of information. But it was Web 2.0. Do you remember that? 2.0, social web that suddenly changed the dynamic from the marketer and the company being the one that was in charge to the customer being in charge. So from 2010 onwards, we have found ourselves in the age of the customer and beyond. We'll see what happens. It might be machine learning, automation, whatever drives that. My hunch is that the customer is still going to be at the heart of all of it. So what we need to make sure we do is make sure that everything we do these days is customer centric. So before we go any further, it's time for you to interact a little bit. We're going to be using Mentimeter. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with Mentimeter, it's a very simple tool. You can either go to www.menti.com and use this code 9942717. If you want to do it on your mobile, you can scan the QR code on your screen. And I'm just going to put a link into the chat as well. And that should take us to Menti. And I want you to answer me a question. I'm just going to slide over to my Menti over here. Is how customer centric is your company? I see we've got some people in there already. So yeah, start telling me, put it in the in, into the Menti. How customer centric is your company? Not at all. Uh, not very, somewhat customer centric, very, or are you totally customer centric? I'll give you a few minutes to, to get onto that mentee and start putting that in. You can't see a link, Colleen. I'll send the link again in there. I've just put it into the chat, Colleen, so you should be able to say it. And Justine, you should be able to find that. If not, you can. As I said, go to menti.com, it's at the top of the screen, and use the code 9942717. Um, while you're doing that, I just want to let you know that we will be using this menti a, a few times uh, through this session. So once you've got into it, don't close it. We'll have the next question after you've done this one. But what I'm seeing here is that mm, most companies here are rating themselves somewhat to very, which is great. Um, I'm also liking the fact that we've got some very truthful people out there who are saying that they're probably not at all client centric. Um, in my, in my uh, experience, when I work with clients on their digital transformation, normally they rate themselves around the very mark. Um, so you, you guys are a little bit more truthful, maybe more honest than that. But I always say to people and to the people that say they're totally client centric or very client centric, how comes they still have um, a load of bad reviews, one star reviews out there. Um, there's got to be something that they're doing, even though they want to be customer centric. Although most clients, sorry, most um, companies love their clients and their customers and their consumers. Being customer centric is tricky. It's not so easy. And it's often down to the use of technology or the misuse of technology that is stopping people from being customer centric. So it's not so easy, even though everyone wants, knows that the customer should be at the heart of the business since 2010. It, we're finding it difficult to do that. 
yet it is so important. So what I want to talk a little bit about is the principles behind customer centricity and how we can apply those to understanding the customer journey in the world of marketing. Um, I also want to just point out uh, that my old company, Google, had the customer at the heart of everything they did. The number one principle of innovation, the number one driving force behind Google was the mantra, focus on the user and all else will follow. Nothing to do with being evil. That was, that was got quoted out of, out of context. This was the key driver. Focus on the user and all else will follow in all the products they develop and in all the advertising and marketing uh, routines and products and frameworks we used. And it's not just Google. Uh, you'll see this in all the big successful players in this age of the consumer, as Forrester called it. Um, so Apple's number one driver is empathy, truly understanding the customer. And there's a bit something competitive in here, better than any other company. And Amazon, well, Jeff Bezos goes that step further. It's not about customer centricity. It's about customer obsession. And this is something that starts from the leadership down. Everyone at Amazon needs to be customer obsessed. So maybe customer centricity isn't enough. And if we think about what's going to be the driver of the next bit of, of evolution in the digital world, it's probably going to be machine learning, automation. These companies that are customer centric are going to be the ones driving that through their own actions, but also through the products they're creating. So it's very important that we maintain that customer centricity and understand it, how to do it. And I have a theory behind this. I think that customer centricity um, and digital drives transformation and this kind of virtuous loop. And there are two key drivers here. Firstly, digital is the catalyst for change. And it transforms things because our customers, our users are using digital channels in new and different ways. And that catalyzes what we have to do to keep up with them. But on the flip side of that, Digital is also an amazing enabler of change, amazing enabler of transformation and innovation, because we've got a whole new set of tools. And for me, digital disruption is when you don't keep up with the consumer or with the, um, or with the tech that, that uh, satisfies them. And transformation is making sure that we understand how to keep up with consumers and how to use technology in better and better ways. Because if we don't, you'll get Ubered. Someone will come in and they'll use technology better than you do to service your customers. Now, it's not always the big Ubering things. It can sometimes be many, many, actually more often, many, many small things, small competitors, just doing small things that, that just satisfy your customer a little bit better. It's what you might call death by a thousand cuts. And slowly but surely, your customer base erodes until you're like the proverbial spoiled frog. So it's key to us to understand both these sides of it, the catalyst and the enabler. So the catalyst is the customer, the customer behavior. It's very important for us to understand that now the customer is in control. They are the empowered customer. We need to understand how, how their journeys are evolving, how their interactions are evolving and what we can do to service them. Um, so again, let's go back to the mentee. It's the same mentee, so you shouldn't need the link again. But I want to ask you another one. This is a word cloud. So before we go over to the mentee, let me just say what I want you to ask you is how has digital, how have you seen digital changed your customers' behaviours? What are the new characteristics you're seeing? And I want you to sum them up in one word if you can, but I'm going to allow you to have up to three. So I'm going to go to the next one down, which is going to be the word cloud. Um, and if you can now type in those words, you can do up to three different words. So you have three different entries you down. How are you seeing your customer's behavior changing? So you can use the link that Cassie shared just before, or you can go to menti.com, but you should still have it open. So if you can, let me know how your customer's behavior is changing. We should get a lovely word cloud appearing. Faster, impatient, informed, responsive, picky. Oh, yeah, we've got picky customers out there. Demanding is coming up bigger and bigger and bigger. Demanding and impatient with high expectations. They are research obsessive. Yes, I love who put that in there. They want it 24-7. They want it immediate, on the go. We have agile customers. Yeah, if they're agile. We need to be agile with them as well. Uh, they want things customer customized. We've got... Um, oh, got uh, pacey, we got lazy, interesting. Yes, they want those shortcuts. They want it to be easy for them. But the ones that are really coming out for me are informed, demanding, impatient. And we've got a bit of speed and fast in there, immediate coming in there as well. Um, 
I have to say, none of these things are particularly complementary to our customers, but it's the reality. That's what we see, isn't it? We see that um, customers these days are impatient, they're demanding, they're, um, they want things now, and actually we have to keep up with them. We have to be there and give them exactly what they need exactly when they want it. They're demanded. They expect there to be an answer. They expect their brands to know that answer and they expect it to be relevant and timely exactly when they want it. This is a, a different set of customers and we need to keep up with them. We need to be there, give them that relevant answer, be really useful to their high expectations as well. Yes, Quat. Um, and Angelica is asking what it exactly to be customer centric. Well, Angel um, Angelica, we, we will talk about, we're about to talk about customer centricity, but what we're talking about is focusing on the customer. Um, and like I said, Amazon being customer obsessed. What I'm not talking about here is whether the morality of it, whether you use your customer data to make everything wonderful for them or whether you use it to get your business goals. And there is, there is a, a, an overlap here between balancing customer needs with your business needs. But customer centricity means having the whole company, not just marketing, focused on what the customer needs because they're demanding, impatient, informed, curious and faster and all the things we're seeing on screen. So what we need to understand is how we can use digital technology to better service these demanding, impatient, informed, curious, lazy, picky customers that we're seeing. Uh, how we can give them the right answer in the right moment in a seamless user experience. Um, so I'm going to go back to my slides here. Um, and I want you to just now, now use the chat. I'm not going to use the mentee for this one, but I, we need to understand their journey and we need to understand what they're doing along that journey. Digital has made that journey a lot more complex with many, many more touch points. I was wondering, just a, an estimate for your category, for your customers, can you give me a, in the chat an estimate of how many touch points you think there are along their typical consumer path to purchase? So Amit is saying five. We've got 50 from Natasha, we've got nine, we have eight, we have three from Karen, 10 plus, 20, 10, 20, 20. So the highest I'm seeing so far is 50, um, 40 plus. Amos is saying not sure. And Amos, I love that honesty because I think not sure, uh, Gwen, Gwen says, yes, it depends on the nature of the product. Um, We've got the highest from Katerina at 140. Um, I'm going to show you that when I, so when I arrived at Google, this was, we obsessed about this. We wanted to understand how many touch points there were. We've done so many bits of, um, bits of research into it. And the answer um, to Gwen's point or to other people's point is it depends on the customer, their expectations, and we don't really know. So this is the outcome of quite a lot of research that I saw at Google from the Marketing Insights team. And you can find this all on, on the Think with Google website. But I find it generally unhelpful. Um, what they've seen is that no two customer journeys are the same. Um, in fact, it's very different, even within the same category, depending who it is. So we've seen on here that Ava's flight journey had over 500 digital touch points on that decision making. Um, but even FMCG things like a, a chocolate bar or a candy bar, as it says here, has sometimes over 20 um, 20 touch points and these are digital touch points these aren't I'm taking into account conversations with friends television press all those offline channels which sometimes we don't even see they get disappear into a black hole so what I was really pleased to see was that there's some new research from Google who wanted to try and unpick this and my friends from the old Google UK marketing insights team Johnny and Alistair tried to draw the typical customer journey and what they saw was something that looked a little bit like spaghetti. They drew the trigger, they drew the purchase, and in between was what they said was a confusing web of touch points that looked a little bit like spaghetti. Um, but actually what the opportunity here is, is there's a space for abundant, abundant information, unlimited choice, so much choice. It's not like walking down a high street where you've got a limited number of shops. On the online world, there is so much choice, so many touch points, so much abundance of information that we as marketers really need to know how to grab hold of that and how to make most of it. Um, so this is where I want to look at today, this new piece of research about this. But I also was really impressed that this came out during COVID, during the pandemic. Um, so they started this research about two years ago, but actually it's really, really important to think about it in the pandemic because um, 
although the, this shift was happening anyway, the, the COVID pandemic has kind of accelerated people's shift to online, uh, online shopping. Um, and uh, although a lot of on, uh, purchases are still happening offline, what's happening is more of the research phase, more of the interactions, more of the lead up to the purchases are happening more and more online. In fact, McKinsey also noticed that customers were being a bit more promiscuous. They saw, they saw in the US that 36% of consumers were um, willing to change brand and try new things in COVID. So COVID is a catalyst for change, also a catalyst for this understanding of consumer behavior. So I'm really interested this came out in this. So this is what's happened. The catalyst for change has all been about customer behavior and all the choice and all the, the world they have around them that's made them more demanding, impatient, curious, all these things we saw before. But the enabling side of this, that's the interesting bit. This is where we can use the tools to do something. And for me, the enabling has to start with a team that really understands the customer. The one has the true customer insight and the access to the customer. And that's the marketing team. And since I was a TV buyer, marketing has evolved. It's not just about giving them 10 second adverts or 30 second adverts and posters or magazines. There is a whole new set of touch points. And marketing isn't just about cons these days. It is the home of all consumer com conversations. It's the, it's the home of all understanding. So um, the marketer has to be multifaceted and they also need have evolved into this central place in the whole company that is leading on customer centricity. So what is the trickiness here? Why do most marketers and all of you say that you're not necessarily customer centric? Why do we see this range of things? Why is it so difficult? It should be easy. Digital has provided us with a whole new set of tools. We've got so much more tech giving us so much more data that we should be able to use. We've got all these new platforms and channels. We've got different formats that we can engage people. All these touch points, it should allow us to do so much more. It should allow us to understand the customer and use real, real insight so that we can plan different communications across their journey. We should be able to segment our audience into more meaningful groups, not just by those housewife with kids. And we should then be able to reach them and target them with a relevant message that really engages them and changes their behavior. And most of all, we should be able to measure that. We should be able to measure that with so much acuity with all this data, but it's made it more complex. It's a massive paradox for me here. Now, actually, although we can do this, we're not doing it. Um, and marketing is finding it more and more difficult to do this. So I got to think of two things. When I, when I first moved into digital, when I first started in mobile and when I moved to Google, I recognized, as I said earlier, that fundamentally advertising hasn't changed. We're still trying to change human cognition and human behavior. Um, we still, they still have the same intents, they still have the same needs, they still have the same desires. Their cognitive faculties haven't changed, but their behavior and actions have evolved. So we need to update that, but we don't need to understand the consumer differently. We still have the same cognitive psychology that we can look behind that. And the other thing I re recognize is that digital came from what we used to call below the line. I don't know if you remember below the line. So when I worked as a TV buyer, everything was about brand advertising. Below the line was this kind of, I don't know, messy, un unloved little cousin that would look at, at response rates and things like that. No one wanted to do below the line advertising. But digital suddenly elevated below the line to the table and then to the top table. And it is now really important. But what below the line does and what digital and interactivity does is it focuses at the end of that funnel. It's very, very good at driving behavior at the purchase part of the funnel and also measuring that. So you get this kind of, I don't know, false security, this kind of a seemingly accurate picture of what's happening in the clicks. But that's not really telling us what's happening on the branding level. And at the same time, we've still got brand marketers who kind of went, well, I don't really want to do that digital thing. Yeah, yeah, I didn't really get below the line. And digital is starting to talk in different currencies, different metrics, even talking a different language to what I understand. And that suddenly makes digital siloed from brand. And this is one of the key problems, what's made it so diff difficult, not just the proliferation of channels, but there's now two different teams often who are now not necessarily joined up. And this is one of the challenges for marketers. 
how do we make sure that brand and performance are not different teams doing different things? Customers do not care. Customers don't think about whether they're being branded to or performance marketed to. They don't want to see your org chart. They don't want to see your silos. They just want to have a seamless experience that enables them to make choice and improves their lives. So this is what I mean by being customer centric. If you've got a team with branding and market and performance are separate and you haven't got joined up data, you haven't got joined up practices, joined up rewards, systems, you're never going to manage being customer centric, no matter what you want to do. We have to look at it from a custom point of view. So this is where we start to look at the research. And I think what this research has done, this messy middle research, it's built on a lot of other models. It's built on standing on the shoulder of giants. Um, so they actually mention quite a lot of models in there. Um, I don't know which of these you use. I mean, if you put in the chat if any of these are familiar to you. I'm assuming we all know Ada and we all know the funnel. But as I mentioned earlier, they're, they're 125 years old um, or 100 years old. And um, Dagmar is an updated one. And then when I was at Google, there were these things about the moment of truth, um, the first and second moment of truth. And that last one, Zedmot, zero moment of truth. Um, one of the ones I really liked was McKinsey's customer decision making. So if any of you are using these ones, I'd love to get a feel. Let me know in, in the chat whether you're using any of these customer journey mapping models or whether there are other ones you're using. You've probably got your proprietary ones as well. Moments of truth we get from Claire. Yeah, yeah, the ones you're taught. So we have evolved from Ada and we've evolved from the funnel. Um, and all of these are becoming maybe a little bit closer to what's going on in the journey. However, none of them I feel are particularly or truly customer centric. And what I was interested in, in this new piece of research that I'm gonna share with you in a minute is how they developed on these, how they built on them. But I was always a, also a little bit upset to see something missing from this. And I don't know, if, has anyone ever heard of See, Think, Do and Care? So See, Think, Do and Care is something that when I was at the Google Digital Academy, um, we put at the heart of all our programs and it's at the heart of all the, the learning programs that Avado have developed with Google. This structure of See, Think, Do and Care. Uh, James recognizes it. Yeah, it, we stole it really from a, a, an evangelist called uh, Avanesh Kaushik. Um, you can read about it on his blog, Occam's Razor. I think he came up with it around 2013, 2014, and then we applied it to customer journey mapping. And what I love about this is it's a bit more customer centric. Not totally, it still balances out the customer need, the, the human needs and desires alongside the business need. And it, it finds that sweet spot in the middle. But what it works is it works on the customer intent, not on the marketing need. So we talk about the customers being open to seeing a message or being a phase where they're thinking about the category and then they have do and care. Um, what these are intent buckets. They're not a funnel. They don't start at one place and move narrowing down to the end when they suddenly do. There are people in all these intent buckets at all times. And the journey between them isn't necessarily linear. Now, I'm not going to go into too much depth on see, think, do and care. If you really want to understand that, I do recommend you join one of the brand activation labs that Avado is running or some of the data driven uh, marketing labs that we're running uh, or some even the mini labs, because it's at the heart of all it. But what we're doing here is in the C phase, we're talking about a qualified audience. It's not uh, housewives with kids. It's not the widest, broadest, one size fits all audience. It's the largest audience that's qualified by data and from what we know about them, that this message makes sense of them. So you can segment the audience, but based on their, in, their, on their desires and their wants and, their, and their, not just their demographics. And this is still a big audience. So anyone who's a Byron Sharp fan out there, we're still hitting a large number of people. It's still mass marketing. And then as people change their intent towards the category and towards the brand, they move into the think phase. And this is when they're looking at the brand, they're showing a bit more signals, giving a little bit more behavioral signal and intent that they're caring about the products, the category. Do, they're showing a lot of commercial intent, so we know that they're ready to buy, so we can send them a different message. And then care is when they're already our customers. They purchase from us in FMCG, they probably bought two or three times of, of us in cars at least once. Um, and that's where we can help them understand that we love the same things as them. We can engage with them on an emotional level so they become fans, they rebuy, and they might even affect other people's journeys earlier on. So I like this, this, not funnel, but this way of looking at the customer journey in a new way. 
However, we still hit the same issue. We still hit this dichotomy of brand versus performance because digital still tells us really what's going on at, towards the end of the think phase and definitely in the do phase. So this is a quote from, from uh, Alistair and Johnny at Google. We know much more about advertising performance than ever before and can measure outcomes with amazing granularity, but yet we still don't really understand un consumer decision-making. And the brand advertisers are still firmly in the C phase, just putting out that one size fits all TV ad. So we still have this middle phase, what, what we would call think here, which is where we don't understand the journey. And this is where the messy middle lives. So this is where I'm going to dive into the research that Johnny and Alistair and the Marketing Insights team have done. I must point out they didn't do it alone. They teamed up with a group called the Behavioral Architects who look at cognitive science. And like I said, the cognition of decision making hasn't really changed. Our evolution isn't that fast. The behavior has. So understanding what the cognitive process is and the behavioral science is behind that has been core to this. And this was two years in the making. They looked at 310 different journeys across 300, sorry, across 31 different categories and tried to unpick what was going on in that decision making process. Um, and this is what they found. But before we do that, they're just I forgot to mention one behavioral scientist that trumps them all. So they've tapped into theories by Rory Sutherland, Robert Cialdini. They've looked at messages from people like Richard Thaler and behavioral economics. But there's one, this one from Jonathan Haidt that I love. It's the idea of the elephant and the rider. And I don't know if you've seen this before. I, I actually use this as a leadership metaphor, how you promote um, action within your groups. And the theory here is that the rider represents the rational brain. It makes rational decisions based on uh, that mammalian brain that we have, the human capacity for thought. The elephant represents the irrational or the emotional side of our decision making. A lot of it is taken on the reptilian brain and we don't quite understand why we make those emotional decisions. If you ask the rider, the rider will say, ah, oh, yeah, I steered the elephant to that conclusion because I want it. We post-rationalize. We try and put rationalization on it, but really we don't understand the elephant. And the elephant's a lot stronger, obviously. About 88% of our cognition is taken up by this emotional subconscious decision-making. And the rider trying to pull back that weight of the elephant can tire very, very easily. So we often let the elephant make these decisions, make these, these judgments for us, but we don't quite understand it. And asking people why they did it, we don't get an answer. We don't understand the mechanism. So this is what the behavioral architects looked into. This 310 journeys across 31 categories. They observed the online behavior and they also observed videos of people making those decisions, talking through those decisions. And this is what they found. This is at the heart of it. The messy middle has two distinct phases. So in between that initial trigger and then the purchase, there is this kind of ongoing virtuous loop of exploration and evaluation. Now, when they looked at this in the Marketing Insights team, they saw this was very similar to what McKinsey call the active evaluation phase. But they wanted to separate it into two separate ideas because exploration and evaluation are actually very distinct. They're similar, but they have distinct sets of rewards and they're cognitively distinct. Um, exploration is an expansive mindset. It's where we're open to ideas. In this point, just showing up as a brand is important because if people are expanding their, their consideration set, being there is a really key part of it. And that's when they're being much more open minded, much more open to messages. Evaluation is a much more reductive process. And that's when we're balancing out the different ideas, the different category information, the mental portfolios and narrowing down that consideration set. And then we may explore again. And this goes on and on. It's not two distinct phases constantly. People are moving from one phase to another all the time. And what we need to understand is how brands can make a difference in that messy middle process. But I also don't want to ignore the role of brand. And the role of brand is very important here. Um, branding is so multi-layered, it's so in-depth. Branding and brand shortcuts and brand understanding can happen from birth. It happens on so many different things. It's a lifelong, a multi-layered association we have with products. Um, it can come from advertising. It can come from everything we hear on the street. It can come from childhood 
TV programs, if you remember them. It's such a broad spectrum. We can't ignore it, but it's very hard to say exactly what role it's playing in that evaluate and um, explore loop. But they did recognize that brand has a big effect and they called it our, they generally called it our exposure to the brand. And that does feed into the model. But brand, especially in the digital world, has been far more accelerated by what we call experience. I don't know if any of you know Professor Scott Galloway, Professor of Marketing from NYU Stern, um, and also the Prof G podcast, one of my favorite podcasts. Um, he's talked quite a lot about how this idea of brand that we've had since 1945 has, has actually changed. This, this kind of shorthand ephemeral wrapper that injects emotion into just kind of average mediocre goods isn't quite as strong as it used to be. This kind of idea of brand-based social advertising isn't as much as it is important. Brand experience trumps it all now. Um, and brand experience can be so powerful, especially if it's negative. If someone has a brand experience, you will jump out of their consideration set and they will tell lots of other people as well. So in this COVID times, when we are so much more accelerated by what's going on digitally, that experience layer is even stronger. Um, there was a, some research from the Edelman Trust Barometer, and they said that 64% of customers now will only turn to established brands, but in COVID times, actually, they wanna focus on products they know and love that will do it. But if that's only 64%, the other side, the 76%, sorry, the 36% of people are still open to changing. And that's a huge opportunity. And we're seeing in COVID that this is a massive opportunity for brands to either strengthen their relationships or an opportunity for challenger brands to take over. So there is Scott Galloway. He's the bald guy he's on the right of the screen. And he says, just as brand equity has moved from promise to performance, it's now moving from words to actions. How a brand acts in COVID times accelerated digital times is most important. And I was really interested to see um, some quotes from Byron Sharp. Byron Sharp, who is the, the darling of brand advertising and also the darling of mass media who say, listen to Byron Sharp. He says, you need to get a big audience. Byron Sharp's take in COVID has been, don't do any brand advertising at all. Um, he says, is it with embarrassing arrogance that marketers would think people are interested in what they have to say about the virus? This is a debate that's raging on. Look at campaign, look at Media Week, look at the drum. You'll notice that Byron Sharp is, is having this argument with it. But actually, it's really important in COVID times that brand advertising isn't what drives it. It's that bit in the messy middle. So this is the model. This is what they showed us. You have the triggers, you have the purchase. Have all that brand exposure, but what really matters is that exploration evaluation loop. How can we change things? Now, this is a model. It's not really the research. So you're probably asking me, what did the research tell us? What are the findings? What did we get out of this? And more importantly, what can we as marketers do differently about this? So um, what they did they in these 310 journeys is they allowed um, mock-ups of a computer screen and an online purchasing, and they put the customers, the subjects, first choice brand and second choice brand in the category they were interested in, in there. They also introduced um, a fake brand. So a brand that they had no background exposure to whatsoever at all. And they wanted to see what differences, what cognitive biases could be in play in making people switch preference from first brand to second brand, or even to the brand they'd never heard of before. And some of the findings are remarkable. So let's have a look at how they tested the theory and what they found out. And they did it across 31 different categories. So even like low cost purchases like shampoo could be massively affected going from first brand choice to second brand choice when you started using emotional and brand triggers, emotional biases or cognitive biases. And these were the cognitive biases that came out. Now, there are, depends who you read, 17 cognitive biases, 50 plus cognitive biases. Some say unlimited cognitive biases. So this is not a definitive set of cognitive biases in decision making. But these were the six that they saw having the biggest effect in the messy middle and six that they could test by just putting these on the brand advertising in these test journeys they were giving them. So let me talk you through these one by one. The first is category heuristics. These are the shortcuts, the rules of thumb that we do to evaluate whether a product is good, whether, whether it's something like megapixels in a camera on a mobile phone. If you hit, hit high number of megapixels, easy decision, or the amount of 
gigabytes of data you're going to get on your mobile phone plan. They're kind of there, they're table stakes. And if you're in a category, you need to understand what those heuristics are in the category and make sure they're there in your advertising. Simple as that. If you don't show up and don't show the category heuristics, people will go to the ones which do show the shortcuts for efficacy in the brand. The second one, the power of now, it goes back to that demanding curious thing we saw before. People want things now rather than later, which is actually a human, um, a human cognitive bias that we've had for many, many years. We've always lived in the present. It's key to survival. Planning for the future is harder, which is why so many of us are bad at, at sort of financial planning and that kind of thing. And in this test, they saw that the kind of that that the the giving something now did make a difference. It didn't make a difference in all categories, but things like FMCG on cat food, laundry, shampoo, as I mentioned before, giving people a next day delivery definitely altered preference a little bit. The next one along is social proof. Um, and this was by far the largest driver. And uh, Robert Cialdini talks quite a lot about how we try and allow other people who are like-minded to us to make decisions for us. It's kind of what we used to do word of mouth, but in the digital world, there are so many more reviews, so many more opinions of others. And actually the way they tested this was just simple things like three star versus five star reviews. Sometimes we don't even consciously know we're making a decision, but the social proof was the biggest driver here of the, the change in preference from first brand to second brand. Um, it was massive across all categories. And in 28 of the 31 categories, social proof was the first or second biggest driver in changing behavior. So we must get that social proof right in that messy middle. Scarcity bias, second, next line down. Um, that's kind of just saying uh, this is rare or limited. Chialdini again talks about three forms of scarcity bias. He talks about it being time limited for a limited period only or quantity limited while stocks last or even access limited. It's only available to certain people. This kind of rarity um, does drive behavior. And I think most marketers know that it's quite recognizable. But I also think consumers know that. They sometimes see it as kind of hackneyed marketing. And although it can be a final trigger, you know, when you're you're booking that booking.com thing and it says only three rooms left, if you've already made your decision, it can push you over the line. But if you do it too much too early, they found it can actually put people off. So be careful with the scarcity bias. The next bias, authority bias, very similar to social proof, but this is now handing over to experts. We think if someone is an expert in a category, we will take their word for it. And it eases some of that cognitive strain for the rider. The rider doesn't have to think so hard. And the, the, uh, the expert knows will follow the expert's advice, especially third party experts. So putting things like which, which magazine or somebody else's expertise on there drove a huge amount of, cog of, of bias, uh, sorry, of, of change, not as much as social proof, but it came a, sec a close second. And across 18 of the categories, it was the second li largest one. And then the final one, power of free. Yeah, yeah, we all love free. There's something magical about free to the point that we make irrational decisions. There was some research a while back by Dan Ariely who's, who gave people either a 10 pound or $10 free Amazon voucher versus a 20 pound or $20 Amazon voucher, but you had to pay $7 for it. Value 13 pounds, value 10 pounds. Everyone went for the £10. There's something inherently attractive about free. It kind of, it makes us very excited. It gives us like an emotional hot button. And it's no different in this, um, in this loop here, in this messy middle. It can be a major influence on many, many decisions, giving something away free. Even if people didn't use it, they, they talk about someone who took up the free office offer of a free breakfast when booking their hotel room, knowing full well they were never going to have breakfast because they were going to get breakfast at the conference they were going to. But the lure of free still has an enormous thing. So those are the six biases. They all work together. Uh, money supermarket is a good one for authority bias. Absolutely. Yeah. Money supermarket is great. And trust pilot as well. Thank you, Jobber. Um, but what I found was really interesting was when all six of these cognitive biases were played together or supercharged, as they call them. When you supercharge the biases, they had an enormous effect on all categories. And I've brought up the shampoo example here because shampoo had one of the lowest changes from first to second choice if you didn't apply any biases. So if you just had the first choice brand and the second choice brand, 78% of the time, 
people still chose their first, first choice brand. They were very loyal to the brand, much more than in a high interest purchase category. But as soon as they applied all six biases, 90% of people swapped from first choice to second choice. That's an enormous jump. And this is what they did. So the, the category heuristics were things like it leaves your hair silky smooth. The, the, um, the immediacy one was next day delivery. The authority bias, they put five star reviews from Trustpilot as opposed to three star. They had the, um, they had the buy one, get one free. So they had the free in there as well. And the, sorry, the, the five stars are, were, um, a social proof and the endorsed by which was the authority bias and the available while stocks last was giving you that little bit of little last bit of, of push to try and get it and when you had all of those six things working in concert it changed it from 23 percent of people swapping to 90 percent of people swapping to their second brand and it happened in every single category they looked at there was a profound change when you supercharged your brand with these cognitive biases across all of these shifting from first to second choice so amazing things can happen just by using the right words and the right different things along that journey. There's loads of this to look at. I'll, I'll give you the links to where you can find this later. But what does this mean? What do we learn out of it? Well, the first thing is that sometimes just being there is the important thing. Having a presence when people are exploring and looking in the messy middle is really important. If you're not there, you can't win. But then those behavioral biases have a really powerful effect. Um, and they can totally, totally disrupt to the point that brands people have never, ever heard of can still disrupt preference if you're using these six cognitive biases. There is still what they call the overdog effect, the effect of brand. Brands still matter. But actually, challenger brands can still be in there. The window of opportunity by using this cognitive science and all their messaging in the right place in Evaluate and Explore. And you have to get it right. If you get the wrong one in the wrong place, you can undo the good work. And heavyweight brands need to combat that. They can't be complacent. So what does it mean for marketing? Well, actually, for challenger brands and heavyweight brands, it's pretty much the same thing. Firstly, be there, especially when brands are exploring or sorry, customers are exploring. You need to have the brand presence. And then and I've highlighted these words intelligently and responsibly use the behavioral science, especially in the evaluate phase. Don't be heavy handed. People see that. If you do it heavy handed, you can put people off. If it's too obvious, it can put people off. But you want to make a compelling proposition, tapping into those biases in an honest and genuine way, in an intelligent way. Um, and then we'll close the gap. Make it quicker for people to do that. Make it easier for people to go from trigger to purchase. Don't allow the gap for customers to come in. Um, and then the third, the last thing here, nothing to do with the actual marketing journey itself. But the brand and performance silo didn't help. You need to have teams that are flexible, empowered and work across those silos to be able to make this customer centric marketing work in the messy middle. So, like I said, go onto the Think with Google website. There's a link there. We'll share the deck with you afterwards, I think, Cassie. Um, and you can read the 94 page white paper. If you don't want to read all 94 pages, the Google Australia and New Zealand team has actually come up with four lovely little videos that go into it. Not as much depth as 94 pager, but worth having a look at if you're not in for reading 94 pages of research. Um, but also what can you do about it is understand as marketers how to use that. I mentioned some of the, the Develop with Google programs that Avado run, the Brand Activation Lab, um, the Data Driven Lab. There is a data session a bit like this, a, a thought leadership session coming up soon. But next week, we're going to do a taster session on the Brand Activation Lab, just an hour long, not the full lab. Um, it's going to be limited spaces. There you go. There's that scarcity bias playing as well. Get it now. Um, it will be limited. Um, and you can receive, and everyone who's on this call will receive an email with those details. You can find it on the avadolearning.com website um, as well, and then you can sign up for the webinar. But it, it seriously is limited because we can only have up to about 30 people because we want to make it interactive. So if you want to find out more about how, and I think one of the questions, how to put the theory into practice, come to the Brand Activation Lab. Um, seventh, it is the 7th of October. Cassie, We've got the wrong date on the slide. It is the 7th of October. Pat, you get a space on that for being so clever. Thank you very much. And Cassie, let's change it up to October or people don't see. Cool. OK, so um, I did mention one last thing and I do want to get one little bit of insight out of you. Um, that last thing. Yes, the, the link will send through. Um, but the, the last thing here is actually the messy middle could also be used to bridge that branding performance gap. 
and suggest that marketers should be doing more and they should be leading the rest of the company in their customer centricity. And I want you to go back to the Mentimeter. Maybe you've still got it open if you haven't. Um, it's still menti.com 9942717, or you can use the code. I want, there's one last question. I want to know, what are the blockers to being customer centric in your marketing? What are you seeing? And again, you can put up to three different words in here. You've got three different goes. Let's, let's have an idea of what it is that's stopping you from being um, customer centric in your marketing in your organizations. Mindset, interesting, yes. Yeah, so mindset, to shift mindset, you need to probably do some education and some training. Senior leadership, I hear that all the time. Yeah, that the, the dinosaurs upstairs don't get it and they don't understand that the customer centricity needs to affect our org structure. Budget, yeah, I've seen budget. Now budget is an interesting one. Um, People always blame money. Money is very rarely the root cause though, um, but having the right skills or having the right data in place, having the right um, iner inertia to change, change is hard. Doing the things the way we've always done them is much easier than doing things. Um, profit, yeah, and so people have lots of sort of goals which are ROI based and doing things that are new are more risk and more reward. So sometimes we need to change the attitude to risk, uh, have a test and learn type of culture and that kind of thing. Fear, tradition, leadership, budget, all of these things are things that the marketing team, I feel, need to lead the company in if you want to be customer centric in your marketing. If your senior leadership do it, don't do it. If they're too traditional, if the behaviors, the mindsets don't embrace test and learn, don't embrace the new digital behavior, you'll never be able to get comfortable in that messy middle and trying out these different biases and trying new things. Um, if you're a newly launched brand, the newly launched brand like Sednaka, yeah, you have to do it. So I'm going to leave it there because I want to have some Q&A. Um, I'm going to leave you with a couple of big thoughts. Firstly, customer centricity is the number one core part of digital transformation. Marketers, you are the home of customer centricity. And we've got all the tech, the platforms that enable us to focus on those users. So it's our job, marketers' jobs, to understand what's going on in that messy middle, understand the emotional and rational triggers along that path to purchase. But it's also incumbent upon us to try and make that change, try and lead across those organizational silos, not just brand, not just performance, but all the things I'm seeing here and helping leadership and digital literacy and uh, mindsets and politics, all those things that are blocking it. We need to get rid of some of those blockers. So some of these things we can address in the Q&A. Some of them are much bigger and some of them you can understand more in the brand activation labs or the mini labs or the data driven marketing labs that Avado are running. But I talked to you for way too long. I want to ask, let you ask some Q&A. Um, Cassie, uh, do you want to let me know some of the questions we've had along the way? And if you've got any new questions, just put them into chat while we're, we're discussing. So Daniel, we've got Angelica's original question. Um, so what exactly does it mean to be customer centric? Yeah, so it, 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 it's actually quite a good philosophical question. So hopefully this has given you some, and Angelica, if you want to put in chat whether this has clarified what customer centricity is. For me, it is about understanding customer needs and understanding how the customer is interacting with regard to your category and your brands. It's not being totally on the side of the customer, otherwise you won't drive any sales, your boss won't like you. But if we only focus on our business need and lead constantly from the fact that we need to drive sales and don't put the customer at the heart of it, we'll never keep up with them. So customer centricity is having the customer insight, their intents, their behaviors, and their needs at the heart of everything we do, driving what we do. Um, I've got a question from James as well. Can digital be used for brand building? Is it predominantly for performance or is it easier to measure? Um, you've asked two questions there, James. And the second part of it, yes, it is easier to measure. We are getting better at measuring offline media and the result of branding online media in the customer journey um, path. Uh, if you want to join the data driven stream, you'll understand a little bit more about attribution. Attribution has always been good at looking at what's happening on a narrow scale. And we've been expanding attribution and using things like machine learning and algorithms to really understand what's going on on the, on the complete picture. But it's a new science, it's tricky. Um, and I think that yes, the uh, brand building can be done on digital, but digital, the digital performance silo has always been on the performance side and the brand marketers have always been not very digital. 
they've started to use YouTube, they've started to use Facebook ads, started to use more display to drive it. But it's only when we get joined up do we actually understand the full customer journey and understand the value of branding media alongside performance. So it's our job to try and break those silos down, James. Ah. What does COVID mean for challenger brands? Well, as Scott Galloway said, um, Roger, COVID is an opportunity. COVID is an opportunity to, to disrupt, especially when um, some more complacent brands aren't doing it. But at the same time, probably as Byron Sharp says, don't start preaching them to, to them about COVID. Maybe if you're debt hole, you've got a right to speak there. And they've already divided opinion. A lot of people have hated Dettol's advertising as well. So it's not easy. Um, link to the 94 page research. It's on the Think with Google website, but um, Cassie will share that afterwards, the link to that page on Think with Google, and you can download the research itself. Marla is asking, how easy, hard is it to keep up with digital when shoppers behave change so rapidly? Um, I'd like to think we can stay ahead of the curve, but we constantly need to evolve. This is the thing with digital transformation. It isn't really transformation. It's constant transformation, constant evolution. And that can be really disheartening for people who have to keep reinventing, and keep changing. But the way to do it is to look at the, look at the consumers and keep up with them. Um, so your consumer behavior is changing, but we're consumers. We understand it. We should be at the forefront of that. And we shouldn't be waiting till it's too late until a challenger brand comes in and uses the new technology before we do. So it's very important to keep up with digital. Shoppers' behaviors change, but as I said, then intents and desires don't. And we need just to find new ways to keep um, up with them as we go along. And it is gonna always be the case. There's always gonna be the next thing. There's gonna be machine learning. There's gonna be algorithms. There's gonna be automation. There's gonna be self-driving whatever, the internets of things. All of these things will change customer shopping. And as brands, we need to keep up with that. We need to understand the tech, not necessarily the granularity. We need to have the people that do that. But as a company, we need to integrate that learning and understanding. Um, sorry, I worked for a business where consumers were not tech savvy and the organization were not tech advanced yet. Yeah, yeah, their brand name held customer loyalty. Um, yeah, well, I suppose if they're, they're, they're not changing. And again, in lots of B2B, sorry, uh, people think, this isn't happening, but people are still consumers. You'll be surprised how people's uh, behavior is changing. Even if it's something, maybe it's an old customer, who old, older generation who don't necessarily use tech the same way, they'll still be working with people that do. And my dad, who's 80, he loves his iPad. So he's definitely online as well. Tara is asking, how can you convince senior leadership that focusing on digital is worth the associated costs? This is a really big question, Tara. Um, because you need to take people away from that safety blanket of return and investment. You can't lose sight of return and investment, but doing something brand new, doing something innovative and doing something different, you can't use old models to measure that. You have to have different metrics. You have to have things like qualified learning. You have to have behavioral metrics in there, um, new ideas that are coming up, and you have to be prepared to fail. All of these big companies, Google, Apple, Amazon, and all of them, Failing is part of the learning journey, and that's a mindset change. Failing can be really valuable as long as you do it in the right way. And if your company only looks at profit the whole time, you're never going to have that. So it's a really massive thing to change. How to do that? Probably a question for another time, but it's a really, really big question, Tara. Did we have any other questions before, Cassie, that I didn't see? Sorry. No, I think you've covered all of them, Daniel. Any, anyone else with any more questions? I don't know if I've managed to answer all of them. Um, it's hard not being able to invite you in backwards and forwards to discuss. But hopefully I've given you a good idea of what customer centricity is. But more importantly, how important customer centricity is to transforming our digital marketing, digital marketing transformation, and how marketing actually is such an important part of the company because customers are at the heart of everything a company needs to do to be transformative and survive in the digital age. So there's a lot for us to do, a lot to find out. If you are interested, I do recommend um, coming along to the Taster session next week, 7th of October, not September, and um, potentially signing up for some of the brand activation labs or joining the data stream as well, which is a little bit more about, about the implementation of these things. So thank you all for spending your lunchtime or your evening with me if you're in Singapore. It's been lovely to have people from Poland, from Cheshire, from Bristol, from all over the world joining us. Um, thank you for so much for joining. Um, and yes, Cassie will follow up 
with the link to the 7th of October and also the links to the research and the on the Think with Google page. James can't see it on the website. I'll leave that to Cassie how to find it. Thank you, one and all. I'm going to put some music back on. <laughs>